Hi, everyone. So thank you for being here for this talk. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me for the second time uh, on this, this third session of uh, AI with the Best. My name is uh, Mathieu Boussard. I'm lead scientist at Craft AI, and we'll talk, yeah, I think I directly switch to the talk and present you the today's menu. So let's move on to the slides. And today's talk is about uh, white box one class classification applied to waste management. So this is a quite technical uh, title, and I will slightly change the title with the second one of how AI can decrease the presence of the trash bins in the streets of Paris. This talk will have two aspects, one about the tail uh, of that project, how we go through the steps with the, our partners uh, on one side, and on the other side, uh, we'll talk more deeply about the one-class classification algorithms, the issues related to them, uh, and how we can use them uh, in such a project. So, as I mentioned, there's a, there's a fairy tale part. So let's start with like uh, any fairy tale. Once upon a time in the streets of Paris, there's uh, lots of people there complaining about waste uh, in the streets, trashes, trash bins in the streets. So here you have on Twitter, uh, one picture of trash bins and one commentary said uh, in the Providence streets, there's trash, there's mirrors, there's top cases. So you have uh, 50 centimeters of sidewalks for you and it's imp impossible with strollers. So when we have Paris for pedestrians, the city of Paris is aware of that. It has been aware by uh, something called the collaborative budget, where they reserve a part of the budget of the city of Paris to any project uh, proposed by uh, civilian par Parisians. And in one of the projects is exactly that. They want to reduce the presence of trash bins in the streets of Paris. So what, what is available right now? There's, there's something, actually. There's a law that states that you must take out the trash one hour before and take it back in 15 minutes after the trucks passed uh, by your house. OK, so that's clean. Means your trash bin should be on the streets for one hour and 15 minutes only. So that's, that's fine. And how? When, how can you know when to take out your trash? It's easy, you go on the Paris website and they say, oh, the trash, the garbage collection truck will stop but, uh, by your house between 6 a.m. and 12, uh, quarter past 12 p.m. So you have more than six hours uh, interval who you must, I don't know, stay at your home and take out your trash when you, the, the garbage truck uh, arrives. That's pretty complex. And uh, it's yeah, quite strange to have those two laws together. And the city of Paris is completely aware of that issue. And that's why they want to, to solve that by providing a more accurate um, time interval, a more accurate schedule of when will the garbage collection truck stop by your address. They already started to, to produce some stuff to, to get some data. And the first point is that now the trash bins in the Paris have a chip embedded in them. That means when the truck stop and pick up your garbage, um, the, your trash bin, the, tree, the chip is read, is read and the, some data are sent to the cloud to be processed. And what kind of data exactly? Let's jump into the data. Those raw data, they are split in two parts. The first part is the collection, the raw collection data. What do you get when the chip is read? The first thing is round number. There's 
lots of trucks uh, going through this Paris streets, and uh, they are they are making a particular round, and that particular round has a number, so it's it's ID. The second point uh, in th this collection data is a chip number. Every uh, beam has a different chip number, so you can identify pre precisely which beam uh, has been collected. And extremely important, you have the type stamp of the collection. So you know when that particular beam has been um, picked up. And here below, uh, you can see uh, I want to, uh, you can see here the kind of da data you have. You have uh, something to parse to find the date, the, the chip, and so on. So you have a bunch of that kind of data. Um, aside, you have also an external data uh, in the cloud of uh, Paris uh, City, where you find again the chip number, and then you find the bin type. Is that uh, some uh, Day-to-day -day garbage is some to recyclable, uh, recycle garbage. So you have the bin time. You, you know what kind of uh, garbage is that. Uh, and then you have the collection address. So where is supposed to be the trash when it is being collected? And you see immediately if you cross those two databases, you can find when uh, um, bin has been collected and where. So that's nice. Thanks to that, we can build a more precise schedule. And there's lots of things that impact the schedule. For instance, uh, the day of the week, you have more trash uh, on Monday, or less trash because people are not at their home on the weekend, and they're not producing extra trash, extra garbage. So perhaps there's less garbage, so it's faster to to make the rounds. Uh, the weather, if it's extreme, if it's rainy, it can be slower to pick up the, the trash beans, um, and so on. Yeah, there's many, you have uh, school days, for instance, where you, are, you have more traffics, uh, and lots of extra parameters you have to take into account. So you, you want to predict, yeah, to predict uh, when will the truck stop by. But here, the issue. Some of the parameters you want to take into account are related to the time, to the time of day. For instance, the, you want to know if the school is open so you have more traffic at the time. And if you have that kind of information as an input of your classifier or your prediction, it's very, you can't solve that because you are asking, knowing that the school is open at eight o'clock. When will the truck stop by? So you have some kind of loop between your input data and what you want to predict, the output, that make it impossible to learn that way. So we will switch. We have another look, say, given the context, global context, time, weather, uh, I don't know, school, or are the school open? Given that context, can the garbage collection truck stop at your address or not. So the output is yes or no, and the input will be the time, and the, I say, we'll see later the, the context to, to predict whether the truck stopped by or not. So we need a classifier. And as I said, I'm working uh, at Craft AI, so we use the Craft AI classifiers, uh, which make lots of things. Uh, here, I would just take like a classifier that produces trees. That's the only thing that interests me in that presentation. It can adapt to new data, it can forget, it can make lots of things, but here I just like it like a tree classifier. So the question and the issue we want to solve today is how to predict the collection time at every address. What we have, uh, as a reminder, we have the um, trash beans, they will produce some data. We put into the classification step in the classifier. Then we will use that model to provide a more fine schedule for my end user. And here the issue. If you're really uh, careful, 
I say I want to, to predict whether or not the truck will stop by. But what kind of event do I actually have here? I've got only the pickups events. So it means I've got only the data of the kind, yes, I took the trash. Yes, I took the trash at that time. I took the trash. So I don't know why, when I didn't pick up the, the trash. That kind of uh, issue is, is called one class classification. And that's the moment wh where, when I want to go deeper in that topic of one class classification. One class classification is a part of more general classification. In the classification, here I've got some red cross, two classes, here with a red cross and here with green, with green um, hyphen. And I want to, when I put a new element, for instance here, I want to predict if it's a red or green one. So I want to split my two, two points in two classes here by this line. And if I've got a point here, I say, oh, it's on the top of the line, it must be red. Or if it's here, oh, it's on bottom, uh, down the line, it should be green. This is a standard classification. Then if, what happens if I've got a single class, like only red cross? It's like in that uh, <laughs> you want to predict whether it's a hot dog or by only showing hot dogs, or more generally, you want to know what is the difference between hot dogs. And if you have nothing to compare, it's very hard. But that's a new family of algorithms. Exactly, to, to summarize, how to separate da data if you have only one kind. And there's lots of, well, as I said, family of algorithms designed to solve that kind of issues. And I will follow a very nice paper uh, called One Class Classification, Taxonomy of Studies and Review of Techniques. Uh, it's uh, from uh, Cheryl Scan and Michael Madden, published on Archive in uh, 2013. And they decide to split the different algorithms, different approach according to uh, that taxonomy. You have three branches. I will be more interested in the two first. So here, as I, as I said, you have only one class, but sometimes you have the class you know for sure, and some data are produced, but you don't know their quality. You don't know if it's a the type, the, the, uh, if it's a, you, you have cross, but you don't know if it's red or green, you only know the, the, the data, you know, don't know the class. Uh, and the second branch here of the taxonomy is you have only positive data. You don't have, you, are, you don't have unlabeled data. You have only positive data. So there's a, a different kind of algorithm whether you are in that branch or this one. The second point of the taxonomy here is the algorithms we, you will use. As far uh, as I know, more, uh, most of the algorithms used in one class classification are uh, some extension to more classical alg algorithms. Uh, and here in the taxonomy, we found that again, means the algorithms used to solve that one class classification or OCC, the one branch is one class SVM, so one class super vector machines, and the other branch is all other kind of algorithms. Uh, so we will go more deeply in that branch to present yeah, how you can solve that one class classification issues. The third branch was the application domain, but I think it's less relevant to what we want to do uh, today. So let's go in that taxonomy and let's go to directly to that branch, to one class uh, supposed to machines. So to remind you, what, what is a super vector machine? Very short, I will not go deeply in the algorithm. I want just to give you the idea of what you can do. And uh, you have the references here. You can go and read the paper. Uh, they're very nice. So to remind you, a super vector machine uh, is designed to separate uh, data. So you have two classes, my, my red one and my green one. I want to separate them by 
the broadest band, the broadest road uh, possible. So we find this line in the middle such that the width between the point here on the border and the line is the widest. So the, this point here on the border are the support vectors. And the algo complete algorithm to find uh, this line and uh, the separation is called the support vector machine. Uh, here it's a two dimension that of course you can extend in many dimension and you don't have to find here a straight line but you have some techniques to to extend those um, those points in the bigger dimension so you can find more complex uh, curves but that's not the topic right now i will just to split my data according to this line and the widest band possible and you see immediately if i've got only one group i can't find uh, a line that separates that group from another because they're only one. So there's a work uh, done here by um, David Tax and Robert Duin called uh, Support Vector Domain Description, where the goal is exactly to, to find a way of using Support Vector for one class classification. You saw uh, in the previous slide, I was looking for an hyperplane to split here between my data. What I want to do here is to find an hypersphere that will go around my data point, my data points. And my new constraint, instead of wanting the widest uh, band between separating my data, I want the smallest hypersphere that um, such that all my points are in that sphere. So you just modify the, um, the function you want to optimize, uh, and it keeps the, the property of the SVM. So you can use the, the, the kernel tricks on that kind of algorithm still to find more complex uh, hypersphere. But the author uh, showed that there's an issue with their algorithm. With this algorithm, you have to define uh, new extra parameters that makes this algorithm works once you find those extra parameters, and it's quite painful to find them. That's why uh, this paper is from 1999, and in, 90, in 2000, uh, 2002, they extend that uh, previous work uh, and in that paper called Uniform Object, Uniform Object Generation for Optimizing One Class Classifiers. And here, it's a very important idea, we will talk again about that, those ideas, is to find first some kind of broad or coarse um, hypersphere uh, that uh, fits all your data points. But very, very coarse, very, not, not precise, very broad, very large. Uh, you can start with an hypercube. So you, you define uh, some kind of bounding box in all dimensions of all your data points. Uh, and in that hypercube, you will generate fake outliers. So you will randomly generate some points that you will generate that you will tag as negative class. So the red cross has a single one classifier positive class, and you will generate some noise or some outliers randomly in that space. Uh, the issue of using that kind of hyper-bounding box, hypercube, is that you have uh, some uh, curse of dimensionality. It means every time you add one dimension, one attribute in your classification, you go exponential in the, in the, the, the space you generate, the space you want to fill. And uh, the probability of your generation decreases a lot, so that you must generate a huge amount of data, fake data points to make your classification accurate. But then, since you have so much point, it's very hard to classify first. And then you have uh, some kind of majority class issue that appears that you don't want to solve. So that's why in that paper, they don't, they don't restrict to that hypercube. They shrink it. They have some method to make an hypersphere closer to the data point where they can generate less uh, outliers. And then, since that that's domain is small enough, they can apply 
the standard SVM algorithm on those points. And then, thanks to that, they solved the one class uh, classification issue using SVM. So you have your point, you generate outlier sufficiently, but not too much. And then you fall back on the classic um, classification algorithm. And why is very nice in that paper, what is very nice is they remove the need of extra parameters they needed in the first introduction in the SVDD algorithm here. Those extra parameters disappear thanks to that, um, I say, outlier generation. And that's a yeah, very, very nice uh, result. So uh, that's all I wanted to say about one class uh, SVM. And let's go to the other branch of the taxonomy where uh, they were talking about other algorithms. And one of the famous other algorithms for classification is the neural nets. And uh, here the, the solution I want to present is the one shown in document classification on neural networks using only positive examples from uh, Manevitz and Youssef in uh, 2000. Here, I, I have to say, I just love the, the idea. Uh, the idea here, again, you have only red cross type stuff to learn, so no negative sample. What you want to, is to build a neural net that will learn the identity function. So you have M uh, input, input nodes in your first layer, in your input layer, and M out, uh, output nodes in your output layer. And you want to, to learn the identity. So if you have a fully connected uh, neural net between just the input and the output, you will just overfit the, 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 the net and you will just learn the identity, but without more, I mean, I say, um, without gaining anything about recognizing my red cross. The key high idea here is to reduce to have uh, in the hidden layer less node than the input layer. So you have to compress your input data in less nodes. So you have to find what is re relevant in your input so, so that you can generate the same output. So you have your input, you compress, you reduce the number in the hidden layer, then you try to repro reproduce your, your input. And as a um, result here, you will, as I said, it's the identity function, so we use the same input as the output. And then, thanks to that output, we will run the classical back propagation algorithm to adapt the value of your inner nodes. And the trick, once you, you do that with lots of examples, you will try to produce identity, identity, some kind of general identity function uh, of your uh, single class. And when you want to decide, so once you train your, your neural nets with lots of samples, when you want to predict here, say you will give a positive sample, it will manage to reduce the number of features. So to, yeah, as I said, to, to take out the key features and try to reproduce the input feature. And if it manages to reproduce it, means it's the same class because you, you manage to recognize the key feature and to reproduce, to reproduce the, um, the identity you have on the input. And if you have a negative sample, you try to detect the feature you wanted of my single class. And when you wanted to, to expand on the output layer, it will just produce uh, random stuff because the feature you try to build are not relevant for that class, the unknown class. And then when you try to match that output and the input, it's completely different. So you can say, I never see that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's it for the neural nets. And then I really love the, the idea here. Oh, just to mention, uh, I've put uh, three hidden layers. I think in the paper it's a single one hidden layer, uh, but it was 2000, so I think you can continue and extend to make more uh, complex and more fun stuff with that kind of idea. So let's move on. We had, we saw super vector machine, we saw neural, one class neural nets. And what about decision trees? 
Again, in 2000, there's a nice paper uh, learning from positive and unlabeled example from uh, Letouzet, Denis, and Guillon. Uh, so 2000. And here, it's, as I said, a little bit different because you have, on one, you have a positive class, so you know that the output is uh, what you have, so it's positive examples. You have no negative examples, but you have unlabeled examples here. So you have lots of data. One part, you know, it's the single class, you, and you know the value. And the, the other part of your data, you just you know it's a real data, but you don't know the value. And what they, they build uh, the POSC.5 algorithm uh, based on the statistical, statistical queries. So on your positive data, you can est estimate positive uh, statistical queries. Ah, statistical queries, and on a reminder of the data, you can compare to the rest of your data, and this, the statistical, the statistics are different. And then, thanks to that, they modify the C45 algorithm to handle those statistical queries and build a tree based on statistical queries. So you, so you, you obtain. Uh, um, uh, decision trees based on statistical queries. The main issue here, I think, is that you are losing um, the value of the data. So when you have a split on the data, uh, you don't have the you don't have the precise value of data. Perhaps you have the, the the statistic estimation. I think it's harder to read. So, but I have to say, I have to admit, I'm not the expert of that algorithm. So we not go go through too much in uh, in this one. I will go more on the next one, which is uh, one class still on the trees, but one class random forest from Désir, Bernard, Petit Jean, and Hout in uh, 2013. If you remember when I was talking about SVM and about generating outliers in the feature space, I mentioned the curse of dimensionality. You can't fill naively the, the full uh, feature space with outliers because it grows exponentially. And one of the good, uh, very nice ideas in that paper is that you will use the power of random forest to tackle that curse of dimensionality. Random forest, when you train your data, you, you are building weak classifier on a small subset of features at any time. Means I've got my training data with uh, 100 features or 1,000 features, and I'll be a weak classifier on four or five features pick up randomly in that uh, feature set. And now the, the nice trick is since you have only four or five or 10 features, but a limited number of features, you can produce outlier efficiently. And you will do that for every uh, tree in your forest, in your random forest. So once you have your outlier, outlier generation, you can build the related decision tree and then combine them to provide the, the final decision of your random forest. Uh, and I pretty like the idea here also to reduce the dimensionality to produce the outliers. But, my title, the title of that presentation, uh, I want to go back to, to, to it, is one class uh, classification, uh, white box, one class classification. By white box, I mean, I want results I can show to non-experts. And random forests are far too complex to be present to a non-AI expert. They are quite accurate, they work well, but they're very hard to read and to explain why I've got some kind of decision. And that's the the last point here on the one class classification is what we did for that uh, garbage collection drug pollution time. The issue is to break the, the to break to break the curse of dimensionality, and I I will use a, con um, a concept called ceteris paribus, which is a Latin uh, formula, that say um, other thing equal. Here. The idea is to use some specific uh, domain-specific knowledge to break that curse of dimensionality. The hint we have from the domain is that 
trash bins are collected once a day. And here, using Ceteris Paribus, I can conclude that other thing equal, changing the collection time will generate a negative example. And that's the trick. I know following only that dimension of my issue, if I generate on that single dimension negative example or outliers, I know there's a true negative and I completely break my dimensionality issue. And that's the trick we are using here. I've got collection time, my red cross here, are collection time on the collection day uh, axis. So Monday, Tuesday, and here it's the time of day. So there's uh, some noise here. And for every time of day, we generate some randomly some negative example on that line. And thanks to that, I just plug, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a decentry algorithm, and the entropy will do the job. We completely remove my noisy data, and I will find that kind of uh, nice, understandable tree. Say that, uh, let's go through the tree so I can go on with the uh, dialogue with experts. So if you are between, after 7.40, there's no collection, never. Between the midnight, 7.40 and midnight, there's no collection. Uh, in the morning, depending, before uh, 6.20, there's no collection. And between uh, 6.20 and 7.40, there's collection, depending the day of the week. So on Monday to Thursday, there's collection, and Friday to Sunday, there's no collection. And we are very happy because here we have a small interval of um, of one hour and 20 minutes, which is far smaller, far smaller than the six hour we had at the beginning. So it's a huge gain, and we are close to the low we want to 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 apply. So here, the new the new schedule. We have we are still generating data, but now we are thanks to our trick I just previously saw. We can uh, generate some negative outliers or negative uh, samples. Then classification, and then I can exploit my model in my application to have a very precise schedule to show my end user. Now, that's when we switch between the predictive schedule and the real schedule. And the feedback for expert, we send them, and five minutes later, we have a phone call say, are you mad? What are you doing? Trash bins are being collected every day. Uh, you predict really bad stuff. Why there's no collection? You say there's a collection on Sunday. It's false. Anyway. And then we, we thought, what did we learn? What we wanted to learn was the garbage collection truck habits. When they stop by my home. What did I learn? My trash collection habits. If I never put my my bin uh, on the sidewalks on Sunday, for instance, I will never I will predict that I no collection on Sunday, which is true. My bin has never been collected on Sunday, but that's false because the garbage may stop at my home. So let's go back to the project and go on on the, how we deal with the expert on that kind of issue. So. We have to smooth, not uh, the, we have to smooth the individual habits. Means not me, but what happened to the streets? One single trash isn't re relevant. We have to group addresses together, but we have no prior information. And uh, there's, as I said, uh, you see immediately, immediately the autonomous address clustering issue. I want to gather address together to smooth, to make bigger groups of individuals so I can smooth the data together. Clustering is a classical thing in machine learning. So uh, the only point you have to be careful in streets is the distance to A to B is not the same distance to B to A, since small streets, for instance, the trucks can go back. Uh, there's a, you can use a for real data or SRM project. You have Docker when you can compute with a, with a map the distance matrix in that uh, in that uh, using that map. So that's quite useful. And then since you have the distance matrix, you can compute spatial clustering using k-means, spectral clustering, db scan, and so on. And actually, it works pretty well. But there's still some detail, and we have to find. We wanted a general solution, but I have to say that we, we failed. 
we fail because there's always some small stuff, so small noise and some uh, extra rules. So we, by discussing with the experts, they say, hey, but in the open data, it's an open platform with open data. In Paris, you have the street segments. You have so the, the streets uh, that are not um, cut by another street. So for instance, here it's a segment, here it's a segment, uh, here is a segment. Let's say, oh, okay. We have to put aside some uh, general clustering to use uh, expert data in a model. And uh, so not directly because we have some post-processing, not to make too big, uh, too, too, uh, too, too big cluster or um, to be careful of some, um, uh, some large streets where one side of the streets has been, is being collected uh, in one way and the other side of the street is uh, being collected later. So that's kind of stuff we have to be careful, but we use the open data uh, to build that cluster and that works very nicely. And then we augment our workflow with that new data source that we plug to the clustering and then we plug in the, the previous model and that's, that's nice. And then they have a new look and the new data, a new prediction and say, oh, you are wrong. You predict a collection in the afternoon. There's only collection in the morning, you're wrong. And then again, with the experts, we, they, I have to, to stress here that they have the rules in the tree. So they are precisely in the tree, say uh, between uh, 15 or 15 in the afternoon, 15 PM, uh, or 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. there's a collection. So they see, they can see that in the tree. So immediately they say that's that's branch in the tree is wrong. They say, okay, so, so you say it's wrong. Uh, let's have a look at data, related data. And we plot the data and we show to them and say, oh, there's data points in, in the afternoon. So what, what the point? And what was funny here, there was uh, some markets on on those locations on those days. And the AI predict those those markets and say, you are collected after uh, 4, 4 p.m. And uh, the, the expert completely forgot about that. And the good point is that markets are again in the op Paris open data and we can add them to the model so they can clearly see when their market and what the impact on the market on the schedule and provide that also perhaps to the end user. So that's pretty nice. And then we have um, that updated scheme where you have open data segment, uh, open data markets, you put them to clustering and you have the new workflow. So you, you just take a new data source that you plug in your, in your um, workflow and you have new model you can discuss with experts. That's, that's nice to, to reduce the, I remember to reduce the interval, pretty, interval of the garbage collection track. That's nice. Uh, I think perhaps I will, uh, let me check. Yeah, perhaps I will uh, stop here just briefly. There's two types of trash beans in Paris. And again, we have that kind of game with the experts. They say it's two time per week. And in practice, we predict uh, almost every day on the weeks, they say that's wrong. But now they know when they say that's wrong, that doesn't mean you're wrong, it means there's something strange. And we start to again showing the tree, the understanding of the tree, uh, what are the decision, why does the decision has been taken, why they are being predicted. And actually there's some fun stuff here is the repetition of the pickups. So there's only two pickups in the day, but for instance here, this line, there's five pickups. And the guy here, he was taken his trash all, over, all around Paris to be collected on Monday, on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So that's kind of behavior they didn't know about. And when they saw that, they were yeah, first quite happy and very um, uh, surprised. Uh, so I will go on. The small trick we did is we, we, we compute the distance with some uh, reference vector it means on Monday and uh, Thursday, and for any uh, trash, we try to to find the dis minimum distance here between round one, 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 two, and round three. 
and the minimum distance we allocate to that. We plot and we show to them, and then we were very happy because we have chosen wisely. Because this map is very close to the map uh, they had. And when they have that kind of points here, extra point that's very strange, it's good to keep them so they can discuss and we can investigate why there's something strange happening in those address. So before now we finish the talk, we have uh, some inputs for uh, recycled trash for day-to-day -day garbage. We have some clustering based on open data uh, for the segments with segments. We have markets plug to generate the learning data from this data. We generate negative uh, samples so that we can classify precisely when will the garbage collection truck stop at the other address. Thanks to that, we generate a schedule that we can finally show to our end user. And that's very nice. To conclude that presentation, that talk, I would like to, to give you two takeaways. The first one is more about the project. We, we have been very naive regarding the data. We didn't try to put any knowledge. We just learn uh, what uh, learn from data and show them to the expert. And by being naive, that's where we we were about. Uh, we were able to find the unexpected, like collection in the afternoon, like uh, seven collection, uh, five collection per week for recycled beans, which is impossible. But we find them. And that's by, by being very naive that we managed to do that. The second point on the project is that we managed to, to, to do those interactions thanks to you, to, thanks to the white box model. If we were not using a decision tree as a final output of your machine learning, the, the exchange may have been very, very uh, slower. So being a model that non-expert can read, really speed up the exchange. And that's how we managed to do that, that project in very, very short time by, again, showing them the result, directly the result of the machine learning. And that's concluded my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I will switch back to the, um, to the chat. So I'm here to listen to your uh, question. Yeah, the third, if, I know it's quite, it takes time to write some questions. So the, the third takeaway, I think it's more general when you're working with algorithms. Algorithms are in the literature are often designed to, to solve general issue. So when you have that kind of general algorithm, I think don't hesitate to go in them and to find a way to break some of the assumptions they made so that they can work on your problem. Here, we, we use the, we break the curse of the dimensionality thanks to the issue we wanted to solve. So that's kind of idea of uh, using specific implementation or specific tricks is a nice thing to keep in mind when you have machine learning uh, related project. So if you want to, to have more information about or more extend about that, uh, that project, you can contact me on the, at the, on the Craft AI website. Uh, you will find my contact on the AI with the best uh, platform. Uh, I think we can have one-to-one -one meeting also if you want. So there's some schedule. Uh, we can exchange about uh, uh, one class classification and what kind of uh, and that kind of project. Uh, and that's it, I assume. So. Thank you very much. And uh, perhaps I hope to AI with the best for. Have a nice day. Bye.